and there's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu that there will come a time when people will be leaning on cushions yeah they will be leaning on cushions and they will be saying I do not accept the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam the Quran is enough for us Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi foretold and some of the scholars in India in the subcontinent at the time when Abdullah Chakralavi literally would give lectures leaning on a cushion and he would be saying to people I don't accept hadith Quran is enough for us and some ulama pointed out that this is the fulfillment of the hadith of Rasulullah his prophecy so there will be people leaning on cushions and they will be saying I don't accept hadith I don't believe in it the Quran alone is enough for us which is absurd which is absurd parts of Quran cannot be comprehended without Sunnah the Sunnah of the Prophet explaining those parts I had a very long interesting discussion in London Speaker's Corner, Hyde Park, with a Hadith rejector. Uh, and it was like over an hour of discussion with him. And I asked him these simple questions. How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you pray? How do you make ghusl? Why do you make ghusl? I asked him, do you have a wife? Yes, I do have a wife. Do you, when you have intimacy with her, do you, do you make ghusl? After that, and uh, he said, I do. I said, why? The Quran doesn't clarify that. Quran in one verse says "fattasilu," in the other verse, in the other verse, the Quran says "fattaharu." When the Quran talks about ghusl, it says "fattasilu," "fattaharu." "Fattasilu" means wash. I asked him, "Wash what?" If we if we put hadith aside, which explains what it means, wash means have a wa have a wash, have a bath, right? For major impurity. Right? So explain to me what does Faktasilu actually mean in the Quran? Wash what? Wash your face, wash your arms, wash your privates, wash what? Fattaharu means purify. Purify what? So if we don't have the Sunnah, we cannot explain you know explain some of these terms in the Quran. We are completely left without guidance. That's why the Sunnah of the Prophet explains the Quran. The Quran is the word of Allah, the Sunnah, the Hadith is revelation explaining the Quran. Explaining the Quran. Baraz Billah Gideshitari Rajiv. Uh, this is this is this is very ridiculous. It's very funny, actually. It's very funny. Uh, thank you, all, ladies and gentlemen. Peace be upon you all. But uh, I in the Shaitan regime. I seek refuge with Allah against the accursed devil. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنَ كَوْلًا مِنْ مَنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّ لِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ هَذِي سَبِيلِي أَدُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ أَلَى بَسِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنْ تَبَانِ وَسُبْعَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ يَا يُوَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَكُونُوا مَا السَّادِكِينَ uh, Baba Sayyidun Aganka, David Ismail, Saeed Adam. Uh, yeah, Vora Vora, I see you. Uh, Nur Nur, I see you. Salam. Uh, Abdul Samad Adam, peace be upon you all. Abdul Jalil, thank you all for coming once again. I appreciate that. Uh, my mic is echoing, somebody said. Peace be upon you all. Abdul Jalil, thank you all for coming once again. I appreciate that. Uh, Kamil, if please, Kamil Usman, if you can just step down and come back, uh, because I it's okay, I check on my other phone, it's okay. Uh, salam, Brazil, yeah, uh, Rock Silver, salam, peace be upon you. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the video I played it because it's so funny, you know, they they uh, the stupidity. They are, they are ignorant, their stupidity, I would say, is, is, is exceptional, you know, uh, just like uh, Sister Benish said. And the dumbness is outrageous, right? And 
it is 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 very 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 funny and ridiculous how these people their perspective or perception works <laughs> salam salis uh, <laughs> it's not easy uh they forget that the quran is talking to intelligent people and not fools so uh if you tell a wise person go go and wash your face in the morning go and wash your face he actually knew what you meant he knows you are talking about using pure water wash the face and he knows the face you're not talking to a dumb person so the hadith use what they think is they think the quran is talking to foolish people and actually that is what they depict the hadith narrations to be they make the the, the narrations of the people in the hadith so dumb that they don't know the difference between even water and dirty water you know and one time a scholar in ghana was narrating one story he says the prophet's wife drank the prophet's urine and then she woke up in the night and she was starving so she doesn't she she, she was tasty and starving. so she needs something to drink and she searched for water she searched for water she couldn't find water so she went to the chamber pot she saw a chamber pot she took it and it was the prophet urine and she drank it <laughs> And in the morning, the prophet told her, um, I, um, uh, I peed in the chamber pot. I left it at the side. Please go and throw it away. And then she said, prophet, oh, was that was that a, a, your pee? And he said, yes. Oh, she said, I drank it because I was tasty in the night. So I needed something to drink. So I drank that. And people were listening to this caller and they are saying, Allah, Akbar. They were excited. <laughs> Wallahi, the dumb, the dumbest level mm, of any religion is found in sectarian religions, right? So if you if you are proud to be a, a Sunni, Shia, whatever you are, then good luck. <laughs> oh my God! And unfortunately, the video, the audio is in the Hausa language. I will have played it here. It is is I think I will have time to play that since I will be giving chance for calls for viewers to call in and you know mammid religions have made people so dumb right and that is why people take your money the scholars and the monks they take people's money for granted and then they, they brainwash people you understand because the moment you use god and then you use somebody they love so much in religion you are you are able to entrap people so that is why quran chapter 2 verse 165 give credence to those who love god more you understand you put god first and then god doesn't tell you to be a stupid person so as i choose this title you see proof and evidences uh, for mankind so it's not only about being a muslim or a believer or no for mankind right you need to understand this perspective so the guy i played his video is called uh, uh, adnan i think adnan uh, rashid right adnan rashid is based in uk and these people you know, I, I I'm shocked. <laughs> you know, it's it's not easy. You know how how man-made religions have made people so dumb and foolish and stupid. You understand? And they lack rationality. They do, they don't have rationale. You know, so the, when they speak, the stupid people find them like like uh, you know like to be geniuses. So even when they are fooling the masses, the masses don't see that. I only played the video of this guy doesn't mean I'm in support of what he said. I only played it because I love listening to the lies when I already know the truth because it's it is funny for me. I laugh, you know, I find it exciting. And that's why I listen to this dumb ass type of people. You know, so uh <laughs> it's not easy, but is it buddy? <laughs> mm. uh ajayi oluwa seun uh first he says good evening sir please reduce using harsh words such as dumbness foolishness stupid etc it doesn't speak well from a preacher and first of all ajayi did i tell you i'm a preacher did you check on my bio my profile does it say i'm a preacher or you're talking out of ignorance are you here to listen 
to benefit from something or are you here to instruct me how I should do my lectures? Right? And I keep saying, if you cannot tolerate some of the things I say, please, this, this panel, this platform is not for you. Stay away. That's it. Don't come to my channel or my platform and tell me how I should speak. I take my guidance from the Quran. If you can quote a verse where God says, if somebody acts stupid, I can't call him stupid. If somebody acts dumb, I can't call him dumb. If somebody asks foolish, I can't call him foolish, then bring that verse, present it, and then let's see. That's all I ask. Quran chapter 7, verse 156, Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, he called some of his people foolish people because they acted foolish. They took a calf, which somebody created with his hands, and then they worship it, and that is foolishness, and that is stupidity. So Moses told God, will you annihilate us just because of what the foolish ones among us have done? So I don't, I don't understand when, when people fail to use rationality instead of using emotions. So in the first place, uh, if you are in favor of the teachings I do, then you're welcome. But if you are here to put emotions ahead, please stay away from my page, right? Uh -huh. Because I will not tolerate such type of uh, statements telling me to 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 reduce what what harshness <laughs> did you use, did you hear me using a vulgar or type of you know uh type of word so what do you mean mm -hmm. yeah salam uh muti muti saying uh yeah uh, two g's the realist i wonder who, so the woman don't know where a pot is in her own house yes according to the hadith you know and I'll find time to play this hadith mm, one day. You know, it's an Hausa language. Uh -huh. It is an Hausa language. So I'll do that. And I'll, you know, present it and then we analyze it. It is very funny and ridiculous, you know. Uh -huh. So uh, let, let's deal with the topic of today, right? And I'll be giving chance for, for the viewers, the callers to call in and then give, present your views uh, as well and tell me, uh, what you have perceived concerning uh, the religion and how we practice it and what is going on, the misconceptions, right? But rather, I put the title as proof and evidences from mankind. Uh, that is from the Quran. The reason why I came to that because I'll be delving into that aspect so that people uh, will get to understand the notion of what I'm here to present, right? So first of all, when we when I take you to Quran chapter four verse one hundred and seventy four, that is uh, Surah Al uh, Nisa, that is chapter of the women, right? Uh, okay, let, let's let's hold on to that before I go there because I was about to talk about the proof that the Burhan, but before I go to that, let me start it this way: uh, when you go to Quran chapter two verse one hundred and eighty five, where God says, "Sharu Ramadan al Lazi Unzil Fihi al Quran Hudan Lin Nas." Then he says, well, by United Minal Huda Wal Furkan, right? So, like that's why I played that those video, that type of video, so that people get, get to know uh the the perception of such people, uh the Sunnis, the Shias, people who follow the man-made concept of religion or the sectarian ideologies, right? Uh so anyway. Quran chapter 2, verse 185, and God says in that verse, he says, the month of Ramadan is that in which the Quran was revealed as guidance for mankind, not for the Arabs, not for any particular group, for mankind, not only for children of Israel, for mankind, not only for Byzantines, the room, for mankind, so mankind in general. So everybody can benefit from the Quran, whether you're black, you're white, you're brown, you're yellow, you're green, you're blue, you're violet, you can benefit from the Quran. You can take your guidance from there. So then God says, uh, as well as what? Evidences, right? Bayinat, evidences. Okay, you can translate it as proofs, but mainly evidences, evidences of the guidance and the criterion, right? Now, to break this down, uh, the, the notion of the evidences mentioned in Quran chapter 2, verse 185, the Quran is to serve as a guidance for mankind. That is number one objective. So apart from serving as a guidance for mankind, 
then God is as well as evidences uh, of the guidance. So it's, it gives you evidences of what the Quran represents. That's the guidance. So you get the evidences concerning the guidance of God from the Quran. Then it says, and the al furqan So the al furqan the criterion, you have evidences concerning the criterion. Criterion is something which helps you to distinguish right from wrong, right? Uh -huh. To distinguish something right from wrong. So that is why Quran chapter 4 verse 59 says, For interna azatun fi shayin farduhu illallahi wa rasul. And if you dispute in anything, then refer it back to God and the messenger. Because God has given the messenger, the Quran, to present to us. Quran chapter 5 verse 67 says, Ya you are Rasul, Balig ma unzele ileka me rabbika. While lam taf alu fama balletta risaleta wallaw yasim kaminem nas. So the messenger has been given the messages of God, and we can find it in the Quran. It is in the one book, right? So when you go to Quran chapter 47, verse 2, it bears it create it gives credence to that as to what was revealed to Muhammad. It is the truth. It didn't say uh multiple things, it says one thing. Hua is used for a singular uh, pronoun. Then Quran chapter 20, verse 2, it says, We did not reveal the Quran to you to serve as, uh, to stress you, to distress, uh, except to serve as a reminder for whoever fears, whoever has a fear of God in him. So we find we can find here by in Quran chapter 2, verse 185, the purpose of the Quran in the first place is to serve as a guidance for mankind as well as evidences of the guidance. So the Quran on its own is to serve as its own evidences, right? And then it gives you the criterion as well, evidences of the criterion. So when we go to Quran chapter 2, verse 159, for Quran presenting its own evidences, this is what God says. Then he says, Then he says, He says, Indeed, those who conceal, uh, what we have revealed, uh, of the evidences, uh, and the guidance. Because we already saw the objective of the Quran in Quran chapter 2, verse 185, is to serve as a guidance for mankind as well as evidences uh, of the guidance and the criteria. So in the same chapter, chapter 2, verse 159, it tells you indeed those who conceal what we have revealed of the proofs and or the evidences and the guidance after that which we have made it clear to the people in the book. So God has brought the evidences clear enough which can be which can be seen this is why when you take the verses of the quran they have 6236 verses and then we have 114 chapters so all the evidences you need from god which god has given to mankind you will find it there anything you don't find it there has nothing to do with god or uh, islam you understand so you base your judgment everything in the quran because god has already made it clear is there for people who can see that's why the quran one of the nickname of the quran is kitab mubin or quran al mubin it is there to manifest things and make it clear so that argument ends right you ask a person okay does it say five salats we should pray five salats no it doesn't Ar argument ends. what is it that you have to bring a uh but the prophet did five why will the prophet do something which is not in the quran because remember he is not an angel. He's a human being as well. So he is part of the mankind who has to follow, also follow the guidance of the book. You see. Uh -huh. So hereby, when we say bayinat, uh, that is the plural form of, plural form of the word bayina. Uh, now, this bayina, you can find it in Quran chapter 98, verse 1, right? Surah al bayina right so when we say bayina that is evidence now when we say evidence it is it is your basis for belief or disbelief right a, a disbeliever can have evidence and a believer can have evidence so it is your basis that you use for 
for your belief huh, or disbelief, then it, it serves as a knowledge on which to base belief of what you have, the beliefs in what you, you believe in. So you have basis of knowledge that you can have to, to prove something. So just like we have atheists, when you ask atheists as to why he is an atheist, he will give you an evidence. He will present an evidence to serve as the basis of his, his, his disbelief as to why he disbelieves. So that serves as a, as a bayina for him. So God used the instance of bayinat as evidences, or it can serve as an indication that something uh, that makes something evident is to serve as an indication. So an atheist can also use a formality of bayina as evidence concerning why he thinks there's no God, right? Uh -huh. So in order to substantiate this argument, people can present evidences to certain issues, but it doesn't really make it the truth. So for instance, we go to courtrooms, people can win cases based on evidences, even though a person can be guilty, but if he has the right lawyer, the right lawyer how, knows how to formulate an evidence in order to win uh, a case logically, right? Uh huh. <clears throat> yes, yeah, salam, writing. Uh -huh. So, uh, Ajayi Oluwa Seun, well, uh, thank you for your opinion, but you don't change anything in, in what I do. Like I said, uh, if you want to, everybody watching me has an opinion, right? Everyone watching me has an opinion. And I'm not here for that, for the opinion. Uh, this is what I'm saying. If you have an emotional tendency, concerning what I do, and you feel like this is what is holding you back from not uh, following the truth, then I'm sorry. Stay away. Uh, if you are here to benefit from what you want to benefit and go, I don't need somebody to tell me uh, if I'm doing something which is not against the Quran, right? If you cannot use the evidence from the Quran to prove to me as to why I should stop something, and then based on your opinion, you will tell me, oh, uh, Brother Shrive, uh, since you are a preacher, I don't like you wearing a necklace. Uh, uh, Ajayi, I'm trying to enlighten you here. You Then you say, I don't like you wearing a necklace. That, that will be like a stupid opinion because in the first place, I'm not wearing the necklace to please you. And secondly, if God doesn't say the necklace is bad to wear, what is your issue concerning what somebody wears? to do his videos. Do, do you get my point? So we have certain things. If a person is doing, it is not for you to now say, oh, you know what? Uh, you said, use the word stupid. So I think, brother, as you, since you are like this, please stop using the word. What, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, so when God says in Quran chapter 25, verse 44, do you think that most of them listen or reason? Then he says they are just like livestock. So I guess, Ajayi, you will be the kind of person who will tell God, God, uh, you are telling us the truth, but God, please don't, don't call people livestock. You know, they, they will not listen. What? Look, the truth is bitter, right? There's a saying which says bitter truth is better than sugar-coated lies right uh -huh. so if you see me using certain words i use it based on the guidance of god i will not use it if god tells me not to use it or refrains me from using it i will use it and i provide evidences for you so if that is not okay for you that's up to you but uh, as to for me to stop what i'm doing and it doesn't go against god who cares you, you understand me uh -huh. so put your emotions aside please and if you want to advise me, please back it up with a verse and make sure you understand that verse properly in order to, to advise me with it. Aha. Uh -huh. So let's move on. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, salam, Nikoti Jani. You're welcome. Munkaela Osama. Alasan, salam. You're welcome. 
Abu Sufyan says, according to the hadith, the prophet's parents are in hell. Can you explain for us, please? The Quran doesn't say anything about that, so I have nothing to say. The hadiths are not from God. The hadith books is not even from the prophet. Did the prophet himself say that? Where is the proof? So put those things aside. I'm not here for that. Uh, uh -huh. uh, Joshua, Elijah, no problem. Uh, Muhammad Gaddafi says, those hadiths are fanatic and misunderstanding they, uh, they are making their marketing with the hadith yeah well it's, it's marketing purpose that's why they do that okay let me continue anyways uh so i've i've broken down the notion of evidence which we have in evidences your basis for belief or disbelief knowledge on which to base belief to base your evidence as to why you understand you believe in something or disbelieve in something so it can serve as an evidence right now when we go to quran chapter 39 verse 41 uh let me let me put the verse on the screen so that people can see chapter 39 verse 41 that is a uh, surah uh zoomer so I share the screen and let's see what, what the verse says, right? Quran chapter 39, verse 41. Quran chapter 39, verse 41 says, Inna anzalna alayka al-kitab al-linnas bil-haq. Then he says, Faman ittada fali nafsihi wa man dolla then he says so what is the verse telling us uh, just a minute what is the verse telling us the verse is simply telling us indeed we have revealed we have revealed the book to you that is second person pronoun that is muhammad he was the first to receive the book uh you know the quran then he says god says for mankind right we have revealed uh the book to you for mankind in truth or with the truth or in truth then he says so whoever is guided then it is for his soul so meaning whoever is guided can be a muslim uh sorry can be a, a, an african an european an american an asian anyone you want to choose so whoever is guided because it's, um, it's about mankind so whoever is guided, then it is for his soul. You are guided for your soul, your nafs. And whoever goes astray, then he only strays against it. That is the same soul. You stray against your own soul, right? If you go to uh, Quran chapter 91, verse 7 to verse 10, it says, wa wa Then it says, falhamaha fujuraha wa taquwaha kad afla manzakaha. So whoever purifies his soul will be successful. But whoever what inflicts it, you inflict it, you put more stress on it, you give it more problems, then you fail. So what you need to understand purposely for your soul is the God who created the soul and gave you that soul has a purpose for it. So in order not to leave you in ignorance or to be lost he decided to reveal a book by revelation whereby it will serve as a guidance for you so then he gives you the free will the free will is so whoever is guided then it is for his soul you are guided for your soul and whoever goes astray then he only strays against his soul that's up to you then God says, and you, Muhammad, the one who received the book, you are not their advocate. So Muhammad is not to stand for you based on anything. <laughs> Quran chapter 2, verse 272. God told him clearly, clearly that, uh, 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 if I remember very quickly, uh, alayka hudahum, uh, walakin Allah yadi man yasha. Quran chapter 2, verse 272. So God told the prophet that their guidance is not based on you, but however God guides whomever he wills. So that the, the choice God has given us is the free will. He has sent the guidance. Now you decide. You want to follow it? 
for the guidance that's up to you you don't want to follow it nobody is forcing you quran chapter 18 verse 29 the truth is from your lord whoever wills let him believe whoever wills let him disbelieve you understand so it's not about a fight you don't believe what god says the god says he has given a sufficient book you don't like it that's up to you you like it follow it simple now we continue. So we have seen in Quran chapter 39, verse 41, God has revealed the book to us in the form of a revelation. And the prophet who was given the book, he has now presented it to mankind. And that's why we have it today. We have the Quran here, right? So whoever is guided, then it is for his soul. And whoever goes astray, then it is still for his soul. You are not doing it for me. It's up to you. So we see it clearly as it is stated in Quran chapter 39, verse 41, right? Now, the reason why I took you to that verse is to show to the mankind, to the people, that God has actually given us a book to serve as a guidance for mankind. So you can take your guidance for, from it. You don't need to be an Arab to take a guidance from the Quran. You don't need to be a superhuman to take your guidance from the Quran. Remember that. So what you need to understand, since you are a human being, yet you are, you are supposed to take your guidance from the Quran. Yours is just to try to understand what what the book is telling you so that's why you need to use your intelligence you need to find your answers from the quran does it serve as a, a proof if it does then yes aha uh, -huh. uh mood hussein is asking a question he says is uh, salam uh baba alam uh he says is nafs equals ruhu in arabic no they are not they are not the same actually uh when, when, the, when the human was created, a ruhu, the first human who was created, a ruhu was blown into him, right? Uh, if you go to Quran chapter 32, verse 7 to 11, uh, yeah, the answer should be there. A, a spirit was blown into him. Then from him, another nafs was created from it, right? From that first nafs, another nafs was created based on Quran chapter 4, verse 1, right? Now, then these two nafs, uh, since they have jesed, what we call body, they have been given body. This body is able to reprocreate, right? So the reprocreation has to be done by copulation, whereby we became spreading humans, right? Men and women. Now, just like a human being is cre was created from what? Mud, or you can say dust, or you can say, uh, you know, but since you are created from soil, doesn't actually make you a sand or a soil or a mud. Just like you, if I'm sitting here, you can't say this guy is a mud or is, is, is sand. No. I mean, I'm now a human being with a body. I'm not sand. I'm not mud right now. Right? But originally, when something is created, it becomes something. So the ruh who blew, was blown into the human, then now it became a nafs. So from its original position, coming from God, being blown, at that time it's a spirit. But then when it goes into that body, now it becomes a nafs. So there is a difference here, right? So ruhu and nafs, they are not the same thing. They play different roles, right? We can see in the Quran where God says he inspired people with the ruhu. But he never said he inspired people with the nafs. Do you see the difference there? Uh -huh. For instance, Quran chapter 42, verse 52, where God told the prophet, we inspired you of your a spirit of our command, right? So the spirit has been inspired. But you don't find the word nafs saying it has been inspired. So nafs is already, you're, it's already within you. You're possessed with the nafs. It's the nafs which makes this body I'm using, this body has covered the nafs inside, the soul. So it has it. So we, we don't try to say that is the spirit no it becomes it changes to another thing uh okay anyways let me let me move on uh now when we continue if i take you to quran chapter 14 verse 1 that is suratul uh ibrahim chapter 4 verse 1 and i will share the screen and let's see what the verse says right Quran chapter 14. 
Yeah, Abdul uh, Abdullahi Haruna Kalindao. I will be putting my number here. Uh, you can you can text me or WhatsApp me later if you have anything you want to discuss or any questions, right? So I'm sharing the screen. Quran chapter 14, verse 1. God says, Alif Lamra. Then he says, Kitabun Anzan Nahu Ilaika. Litukhurijan Nasa. Mina Zulmasi ila Nur. Bi Izni Rabbihim. Ila Siratin Azizin Hamid. So Quran chapter 14, verse 1 is telling us that uh, Alif Lamra. God says, A book. We all know what a book is. A book comes from the word uh, kataba. Kataba means to write, to inscribe, to write down something, to jot down something, right? So when it has been written and it becomes, it is fastened together on sheets of paper and it's joined together, it becomes a kitab, meaning it has is something which has been written. So now we have it as a complete book in our hands. So that God is telling us a book which we have revealed to you, that is Muhammad, he is the first, the first person to receive the book, in order to bring the people, mankind, God used the word Anasa, so mankind in general, right? So like I said, the guidance of the Quran is not only limited to the Arabs, neither is it only limited to the children of Israel, it is for everybody. So everybody can take his guidance from it. So don't let anybody tell you that you have to be an Arab or uh, the Quran is not meant for you. It's not meant, no, it's a lie, please. So a book which we have revealed to you, Muhammad, in order to bring the people, that is mankind, out of darknesses into the light, right? Uh -huh. The Quran itself, God has made it as a light. According to Quran chapter 42, verse 52, uh, God has rendered it as a light in order to guide people with it, right? And we all know what a light does. If you are in the darkness, let's say right now, if I switch off the light and it's dark in here, the only thing that can give me the chance to walk out of this darkness is a light. When you bring me a torchlight or a light. So the moment the light sets in, I can find a way to exit the darkness. Do you see how it works? So the purpose of the Quran, whatever gives you guidance, gives you light. Then it takes you out of darkness where you can find the path to go. So what the Quran is here to do as a book is, God says to take us out of the darkness is into the light by the permission of their Lord to the path of the Almighty, the praiseworthy. So the book, since it comes from God, it is here to set path, to give you the path, to show you the light, where to pass and where to go if you are looking for your God. So Quran chapter 73 verse 19, it says, For ila rabbihi sabila. So whoever wills, let him take the path to his Lord. You understand? You take the way to your law. So since I'm a Muslim and I'm submitted to God, mine is just to take what God is telling me in his own book, not in the Sahih Bukhari or any book. At the end of the day, Sahih Bukhari is not the one going to judge me or neither is your scholar going to judge me. It is God, for God's sake. He is going to judge me for what I did. Do you see? So this is some of the logic people lack and they try to put weight on other, you know, cycles of life that it has it doesn't play any relevance in your faith in your salvation you see so these are the things people should be cautious of yeah thank you very much i said uh -huh. so that is quran chapter 14 verse 1 right so i gave you three verses chapter 2 verse 185 talks about mankind chapter 2 verse 159 also talks about mankind god has made it clear for mankind so then i break it down i took it to chapter 39 verse 41 God talks about mankind. He revealed the book to mankind. Then the last one, the fourth one, I took you to chapter 14, verse 1. Then he says to bring mankind out of darknesses into the light. So he tells you where the position of mankind, where we are. So we always need a light, something to lead us, to show us the path. That's why we have the Quran today. You go to every country, the Quran is there. But what do people do? They put it on their shelves. And like, rather listen to the sheikhs and imams, the lie to them from Sahih Bukhari. You go to the masjid, the hutuba, whatever you are listening to, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Jamia Tirmizi, uh, Abu Dawood, Imam Maliki, Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, whatever, whatever. That's what they keep telling you. Then they leave the important message aside. So that is the danger here. So now let's move to the proof. Right? Let's move to the proof. <clears throat> 
Uh, Abu Abu Sufyan is asking a question, right? He says, can you please explain the verse for us? Does the verse mean the Christians and the Jews and the Sabians will enter paradise? Thank you. No, that is not what the verse means, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, let me break down this verse for people to understand clearly. In that verse, when God mentioned the Christ, uh, the, the, the Nasara, that is the supporter, the parents who supported Jesus, Nasara, that now, modern day we call it Christians, right? Then we have the Yahud, that is the Jews. Then we have the Sabians, Sabi'in. Then we have the Magians, uh, Majus. Uh -huh. So this, all this group God mentioned. Then God says those who believe in Allah, that is the real God, not the fake God. Because remember, Quran chapter 47 verse 19 says, and know that there is no God but Allah. That is the one God, right? So how can we know the one God? Go to chapter 112, Surah Al-Ikhlas. Read from verse 1 to verse 4. It says, Kul, who Allah ahad? He, the God, is one. It's not two, it's not three, right? Just like Christians, some Christians will tell you. He's not three. He's not two. He's one. Then God says, Allah who summer, the everlasting God. He has always been the God from day one to last day. So it's not as if a new God. Then he says, Lam yalid wa lam yukhlad. Lam yalid wa lam yukhlad. Right? So he does not, he did not give birth and nor was he begotten. But the other gods you see people forming in other religions, you find out that it's either they tell you somebody has been given birth and they are worshipping him, or some a god who has been created and they are worshipping him. You understand? So the vice versa. Then God says, Walam And he has no, nothing can be compared to him, or he has no equals. Right? So the one God, he has no equals. But when you check in the concept of Christianity, you go to Judaism, you go to uh, the Sabians, you go to, if those people will leave those fake ideologies, the man-made ideologies, and implement the one God is saying, those who believe in Allah, and then act righteous, according to the Quran, Quran chapter 2 verse 177 tells you what righteousness is, al-birra, right? And they will act righteous pertaining to what God describes. Then God says they will have no fear upon them, nor will they grieve. So if you do it aright, it's just like working in the company. If you do it precisely as your boss told you to do, why, why are you going to be afraid? Do you see the point? So the people take these verses out of context. Chapter 2, verse 62, and chapter 5, verse 69, they take it out of context. And then you tell you, look at the contradiction in the Quran. It says Christians, Jews, whatever, whatever, they can go to heaven. No. That you don't take the verse in the face value, you need to understand the context in which God is saying the, the statement. So, this is the problem here. So, I hope uh, that helps you out. Thank you. Uh, salam, Joe Ip. Uh huh. Uh, Natalia says, I have a question. Uh, can I ask? Oh, uh, it depends. Okay, let let uh, Natalia, I'll give you the chance to ask me. Let me just skip the topic and finish this part. Then you, I give you the chance to uh, to ask. I will open the phone lines. Then you can call, inshallah. Uh huh. So, hey, salam, Liman Imrana. I see you. Uh huh. Okay. So let me continue. Now, when I take you to Quran chapter four, verse one hundred and seventy-four, that is Surah to Nisa, chapter four, verse one hundred and seventy-four. And I'm going to show you the evidence concerning the Burhan. When we say Burhan, what does it represent and what is it for? Burhan, right? Uh -huh. So Quran chapter 4, verse 174. And let's see the evidence concerning uh, that. And then I'll break down the notion of understanding what a Burhan is. So Quran chapter 4, verse 174. Yes, Quran chapter 4, verse 174. It says, Ya ayyuan nas. So God is talking to the people, mankind. He's not only talking to the Arabs, the Jews, the Christians, the, the, the children of Israel. No, mankind in general. So 
whether you are Chinese, you are African, you are Indian, you are Caucasian, is talking to you, right? So he says, Yeah, you are nurse. Karja akum burhanun mi rabbikum. Then he says, Wa anzal na ilaykum nuran mubina. So the interesting part of this verse is God is talking to mankind. He says, Oh, you mankind. So, so many a times in the Quran, you see God is saying, Yeah, you are the kafirun. You see God says, Yeah, you are uh, muminun. You see God says, Ya uh, bani uh, Adam. You see God says, Ya bani Israela. Uh, you, you see God many a times using different connotations to actually address a particular group of people. But hereby we see God says, yeah, you are nurse. So it's limiting the information, the statement to mankind in general. Then he says, a proof has come to you from your Lord. You see, so here somebody might ask, why didn't God use the word Bajina here? Instead, he used the word Burhan. Burhan is more, more tangible, I would say, than the word Bajina. When we say Burhan, it is something to seal an argument, to solidify your, your, your statement as to be factual. You understand? So God now used the word Burhan has come to you from your Lord. So he didn't limit this factual information to only Arabs or children of Israel. He says mankind in general. So every human being can take his Burhan from the Quran because that is the word of God now. So God says, oh, you mankind, a burhan, a proof has come to you from your Lord and we have revealed to you, ilaykum, this is in plural sense, jama'un, plurality. We have revealed to you, that is mankind, a clear light because you need something to take you out of the darknesses and not only one darkness. According to Quran chapter 14 verse 1, there are multiple forms of darknesses, but there's only one form of light. God never describes the light in the Quran as multiple. He describes it at one light. Whilst he described many forms of darkness in different formalities. Zulumat, it is a plural form of, uh, you know, darkness. So now God says, and we have revealed to you a clear light, not only a light. There's a difference. Right now, I have about three lights in my room right now. But one of the lights is more brighter than the other ones. So God not only said he has re revealed a light to you he has brought a clear light and what is a burhan supposed to do now when we say burhan a burhan is supposed to what act as a factual evidence that helps to establish the truth of something the act of validating finding or testing the truth of something so when he brings the clear light it shades light on the if issue you are struggling with then argument ends. No need for back and forth. Quran says it's final. You believe in is the book of God. I believe is the book of God. What's the argument now? So it is only the mushriks whereby you quote a verse of the Quran. He understands what you mean, but he said, ah, hey, no, no, that is not the proof. It is not coming from Sahih Bukhari, so I don't believe. You understand? Mm -hmm. So what do we say? Proof is uh, is is even though it can be interchangeable with evidence with uh bajina that is burhan but burhan is stronger than than evidence like i said i told you earlier when you are dealing with evidence it can be your personal evidence you can go to a courtroom you can use an ev a fake evidence to use to win a case you can use a lawyer can formulate an evidence to win a case even though he's not truthful so that is why when you are defining the word evidence, the bajina, it becomes itself as <clears throat> your basis for belief or disbelief. It is It can be a knowledge on which you base your belief. So you only have the knowledge and you base your belief there as an evidence. But when we are talking about the proof, that is the burhan itself, it's more tangible in such a way that because it represents facts. So it's any factual evidence that helps to establish the truth of something, the truth of something. Whilst giving an evidence, it doesn't necessarily mean the evidence you are giving is the truth when it comes to evidence, right? So in a courtroom, people give evidences to certain things they say, but it doesn't necessarily mean that is the truth. But when you are dealing with the Burhan, it sheds light to any 
argument. So that is why Quran chapter 2 verse 111, God says that the Jews and the Christians will say none will enter paradise except if you are a Jew or a Christian. Don't get God ask us to tell them. Kul hatu bur'anakum in kuntum swadikin. You understand? Tell them, bring your proof. He didn't say bring your uh, your, your uh, bayina or bayinat, your evidences. No. Bring your proof, your burhan, if you should be truthful. Bring it. That is to solidify the information, to, to validate the claim as to no argument again. Right? But sometimes when you provide certain things as evidence, you give people room, still they can argue ag against it. So it depends. Even though they can be interchangeable with proof, but not necessarily the same thing. So now, God told us in Quran chapter 4, verse 174, he says, Oh, you mankind, a proof has come to you from your Lord, and we have revealed to you, that is people, a clear light. Not, so not only a light, a clear light. So let's understand this difference. Now, dealing with uh, the proof and evidences, when, when we say proof, you hear many a time the scholars, when they are telling you something, they don't use proof. No, they don't use proof. What they use is, they use evidences according to other people's claims. Do you see? They use evidences according to other people's claims to teach you, to lecture you, to indoctrinate you, just like the last lecture I did, indoctrination. So that is how we have a lot of mazhabs around us today. That is a lot of doctrines. So what you need to understand is to know how to differentiate evidences and the proof. So God is the one who has given us a proof. And this proof is not only for the Arabs, it's for mankind. So whenever somebody is telling you something, just ask him, where is the proof? Bring your proof. Bring it. Where is it? Let's check. He brings it, you check it. That's the proof. You understand? So when we go to Quran chapter 29, verse 49, God says, Bal huwa ayatim bajinat fi suduru lazina utul ilm. Then he says, Wa ma yajhadu bi ayatina illa zalimun. So God says, in fact, its verses, the Quran, God used the word huwa, which is a masculine pronoun to address the book, that is the Quran. He always used a masculine attribute for the Quran or the book. So, in fact, its verses, its signs, are evidences in the bosoms of those who have been given knowledge. But they are not evidences in the chest of the transgressors. So you see what it represents. When we are talking about the Bayinat, they serve as a basis for someone's belief or disbelief. It is a knowledge that you have based on your belief. So this knowledge, God now dis defines the evidence here by saying, in fact, its verses are uh, what? Evidences in the bosoms of those who have been given the knowledge. But none rejects our verses except the transgressors. So for a transgressor, the Quran doesn't serve as an evidence for anything. You understand? It doesn't work for him. But a knowledgeable person who has knowledge can use the Quran to serve as an evidence to as to why he believes in something. Do you see the basis here? Again, if you go to Quran chapter 10, verse 15, uh, two more verses before I, I, I open the phone line. Quran chapter 10, verse 15. Uh, let me, uh, okay, let me put the verse on the screen. Quran chapter 10, verse 15. Then I, I share the screen and let's see what the verse says, right? Quran chapter 10, uh, verse 15. Yeah, salam, my sister Rashida. You're welcome. No problem. Aha. Uh -huh. So let's say, Wa iza tutila alayhim ayatuna bayinat. Salim, yon kurka kazuna. Eji je nazua je. Eji je nazua. Gema mankata ba kali pana na Kaji. Kuleko fananda kiao. Na godi. Waiza tutula alayhim ayatuna bayinatin. Then he says, Kala lazina la yarujuna lika ana. Then he says, Ahti bi Qur'ani gayri haza au baddilhu. 
قل ما يكون لي أن أبدله من تلك النفس إن أتبع إلا ما يوها إلي يعني سيس إني أخاف إن أسيت ربي عذاب يوم العظيم that is يوم عظيم now the verse is telling us clearly that and when our verses are recited to them as evidences that is bayinat the plural form of bayina evidence those who do not hope to meet us meaning to meet god right they say bring a quran bring a reading other than this this is this is this is to tell people for people who say they are different versions of the quran there's only one version god has given right so they will say bring a quran other than this or change it now the messenger was asked to say ma yakuluni an ubaddilahu min tilka in nafsi it is not for me to change it by myself spontaneously for people who are thinking the quran belongs to muhammad so here here you can do whatever he wants no so if prophet muhammad cannot do whatever he wants to the quran what tell what gives you the right or what makes you think the sahaba or whoever you are claiming wrote the quran can do what they want whatever they want and you hear people out of ignorance telling you oh when the quran was revealed there was no tashkil were you there kana <laughs> were you there when it was revealed there was no tashkil were you there <laughs> go to quran chapter 35 verse 31 to 32 the same way god caused the prophet to receive the quran based on inspiration he he will cause this another servant of his to inherit the book so if god can choose a nobody in our an arabian peninsula and inspire him with the quran what makes you think of that prophet god cannot do the same thing so must it be in a book form that it has to be preserved god has already protected his book quran chapter 56 verse 77 downwards he says in the quran al karim fi kitab makunun then he says la yamasu illa al mutahharun so god has already protected his book he told you in naula quran al karim fi kitab maknun maknun it's a protected book already so god protects it based on the inspiration he has revealed you understand so quran chapter 10 verse 15 when these people are not okay with the evidences you are presenting from the quran they will tell you bring a quran other than this or change it god asked the messenger to say it is not for me to change it spontaneously by myself that i only follow what is inspired to me you see the difference here he's only following what he has been inspired not what you think is the narrative no so then he says indeed i fear the punishment of a terrible day if i should disobey my lord and here are your scholars disobeying god do you see how can an horrible man like this follow only what he has been inspired and out of the foolishness of some scholars they are now telling you if you follow the quran alone you are lost was a prophet lost the answer is no so why would i be lost if i'm following my role model the same way he did now the last verse before i give a chance for phone calls when you go to quran chapter 22 verse 72 i put the verse on the screen let's see quran chapter 22 verse 22 uh, verse 72 now this is a verse people can relate to very much you can relate to this verse a lot because it does happen in our lives today when you are reciting the verses as proofs what actually transpires between you and people who don't believe in the verses right nazir nsa you are welcome salam uh muhammad zanji you are welcome salam uh let me share the screen as to what the verse says Go Quran 22 verse 72 God says wa iza tula alayhim ayatuna bayinati then he says ta'rifu hmm? ta'rifu fi wujuhi wujuhi allazina kafaru then he says al munkar this munkar yeah this munkar eh uh, samad rashid eh uh, salam brother rashid uh, salam also abdul rashid bansi you're welcome quran chapter 22 verse 72 so this munkar munkar so this munkar is an act of uh denial uh, in ghana you hear people calling the sunnis munkirai munkirai 
Munker, Munkirai. <laughs> Aha, people who find things abominable or they claim this is deniable thing, right? Aha, so Al Munkar, you recognize denial in their faces. When, when, and when our verses are recited to them as what? Evidences. This is what God is saying. Then he says, Ta'arifu, you will recognize, you will notice, you will recognize fi wujuhi. Wujuhi lazina kafaru. On those who reject the verses of God, you recognize denial in their faces. Then God says, Yakad, uh, Yakaduna, ah, yes, tuna, Yakaduna, yes, tuna, Bilazina, Yatuluna, Alehim, Ayatina. So, what you notice is they almost attack, they almost attack those who are reciting our verses to them. That is, that is the sheer hatred they have in their chest, in their heart. The hatred they can't hide it. So when the verses of God are recited to them as evidences, you will recognize denial in the faces of those who disbelieve. They almost attack those who recite our verses to them. That is the verses of God. So now God is saying, say, he's telling the messenger, shall I then inform you what is worse than that? Then he says, the fire which God has promised those who disbelieve and wretched is the destiny. That is a punishment for those who deny the verses of God when they are presented to them as evidences. You see, uh -huh. so this is an unending fight between the truth when you present the, the evidence from the verses of God and then you finally conclude with the proof from the book. The disbeliever cannot stand it, even though the book is to serve as a guidance for everybody and is to serve as a proof for everybody. But yet still, they will be on the denial end. Daniel Danjo says, uh, he says, Baba, is the Bible from Allah? The entire Bible is not the word of God. No. Because the entirety of the Bible, you find the words of Paul, you find the words of the, you know, the people, different people who have written their own words there. So entirety of the Bible, I won't say is the word of God. But yes, you find some words from God there which is confirmed in other scriptures. Yes, some words are from God in the Bible, but the entirety of the book has been tempered with. So that's what I can say for that. Uh -huh. So uh, Sister Natalia, you can ask your question and I'm opening the phone phone lines. Let me put the number. Uh, Sister Natalia, you can call uh, to ask your question. Uh, let me put the phone numbers there. And for those who have been subscribed to the YouTube channel, I have a YouTube channel where you can watch and benefit from the lectures I've done, uh, you know, in the past. You can benefit from it. Uh -huh. So that is the phone number down there, scrolling down there. Uh, you call me via WhatsApp call and ask your question. Okay, a first caller is calling. Hello, Yeah, Alex Salam, uh, sister. How are you? Hi, hi, I'm good, alhamdulillah. How are you, Great relief. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Yes. Yeah, Thank you. Allah, yes, for sure. I had a question about uh, prophets and messengers mm -hmm. because I had a peaceful dialogue with a friend of mine and, and talking about the prophet. Mm -hmm. You know, he thinks it's otherwise. So the prophet, he had a book from God. A revelation and he says it's not like that but anyway his argument was listen that if my is also a prophet because i gave him the verses where god mentioned all the prophets and ismail is even is, is one of them right yeah so then we talked about uh, our prophet Salam, who is not unlettered but unlearned yeah Quran says he's unlearned yeah so so he says to me okay uh if the prophet is the first prophet to go to the arabian because they were an unlearned people he says how come that ismail already had a book if he's a prophet you understand 
at the at the time of uh, Ishmael, there was no people called Ar Arabians at that time. Uh, I give an ah. I give an example. Uh, right now, I come from Ghana, right? Yes. But yes. but my father originally, my father was is not a Ghanaian because when he was born, Ghana didn't have independence. Ghana was called Ghana after we gained independence, 1957. So originally, my dad was part of Gold Coast before Ghana became Ghana. So Wonderful. if wow. if so if yeah. I'm talking about my father's history when he was born, I wouldn't say he was born in Ghana. I would oh. say he was born at the time of Gold Coast. But that country called Gold Coast is now called Ghana. So same way, if we have to deal with the de uh, genealogy of people, of history, uh, you can live in a particular place. At that time, it's not called that, that, that name. It is after your, your time, it can become something else, or the group of people who will be existing there will be a different people. For instance, okay. for instance, yeah. Israel, Israel in the Middle East, right? That country didn't exist in 1947 or 1946. It never existed. There was no country called Israel on earth in 1945 or 1946. True. It, it didn't 100%. exist. True. So that yeah. land was called Palestine. It was part of Palestine. But now, if you're talking about Israel, people would think, oh, it's already been, been there. So those people based in Israel now is only formulated after they gained the Israeli state in 1948. So now it becomes Israel. So somebody will say, oh, how come uh, you are living, somebody who was living there is not part of Israel? No, Israel didn't exist at that time in 1944, 1946. So you can't, people need to know how history works. So if we say Ismail was based there, at that time there was no Arabian. So how, even if he was based there, we can't say he was sent to Arabians. How can you be sent to people you are who are not based next to you? Yes, true, true, and also uh, there was uh, Sarah. That name we get from he the uh, that is the name we get from the Bible. The Quran doesn't mention the name Sarah, but the point is, well, oh. yeah, he doesn't mention the name Sarah. Yeah, yeah. what yeah, okay. in the Quran only name of a female name mentioned is Mary. That is the only of a woman mentioned in the Quran, Maryam. Wow, yeah. yeah, and the reason exactly, and the, the reason is the name is not an issue. If somebody says her name is Sarah, I don't have issue with it. Having a name for something is never it doesn't go against the Quran at all. For instance, the the, the yeah. spouse of uh, Adam, if you call her Hawa or Eve, I don't have a problem with that. Name doesn't take anything name, away. Is, is it, it's, not, it's not relevant. Okay. okay, okay, yes. True. The, the lesson true. and the history yeah. is what matters. For instance, I just told you my father's history, but I didn't mention his name. What do you need the name for? <laughs> true, you understand. Uh -huh. So, people need to understand yes. how uh, you know history and messages work. Is, is you need the lesson behind it. It is not about who is what, who is only when there's a doubt in information. Uh, there's a lie or there's a doubt. That is when you need name to go and check history background or archives to verify things. But names are not really, yes. really necessary. It's 100% true what you say, but I, I really try to explain to people what the difference is to a prophet and, and the messenger. And you already had a reading about that, but the verses are so clear. Yeah. If, if I uh, put, uh, if I, I can show people the verse of... Uh, uh, angels being a messenger, then people say yes because the, the angel he, they brought the message to the prophet. Uh, that's why they're messengers. Uh, and Cor not prophets. Uh huh. Quran, Quran chapter chapter two verse two hundred and thirteen. Right. Quran chapter yeah. two verse two hundred and thirteen. Uh, explains yeah. the position of prophets and who are prophets and the duty of prophets. Right. Okay. And yeah, the reason be it is, uh, it's not as if uh, prophets are not messengers. Yes, prophets are messengers, but me not every messenger is a prophet. But rather, the prophets are messengers at the same time because they receive the message and they have to deal with it. But not every messenger is a prophet, according to the Quran. 
Because if somebody tells you every messenger is a, pro a prophet, it goes against chapter 22, verse 75. According to chapter 22, verse 75, God chooses messengers among angels and the people. So if people say every messenger is a prophet, then what about the angels? Has, has they ever seen an angel prophet? Indeed, this verse, I, I was searching for this verse, really. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. So th these I'm are some of the... Yeah, these are some of the arguments. When people make, they forget that the Quran is here to serve as a proof, burhan, for the people. So this is where we take our proof from. What the Quran says, we use logic, we analyze it, that is final. No need for any room for people's opinions. We don't need opinions. So that is... We that don't is, need opinions, never. Exactly. 100%. That is a point. Okay. Any next question Thank before we so go? Much. Or does it? Um, oh... I always have a lot of questions because in this reading we were talking about the roof and that. Yeah, yeah, somebody uh, asked. You pointed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm listening. Okay, and you pointed the difference between them and this distinct roof where we get not much uh, of information mm -hmm. that, like God said, the verses. I really, I am, I'm so curious about this rule because god says okay we, we blow the roof in the, in the human being mm -hmm. but in other sense he's talking about some of the people we scraping uh, with with the roof with mm -hmm. the roof yeah yeah so and then in other verses we read uh, ruh al uh, is an angel and then ruh al yeah it's, it's also an angel so there are a lot of kind of roofs in the yes Quran. yes even yes. even a rule was sent yes. to Maryam in Quran chapter 19 verse uh, 15 downwards a rule was sent to oh, her no. and he became a human being so uh, oh, there is a difference in understanding how rule works and how nafs works you understand so people need to understand when something becomes something doesn't mean that thing is that thing for instance i give an example the reason why i said that is uh when i'm making tea when i put water in this glass it is just water in the glass right mm -hmm. but as soon as i go and put a tea bag inside the tea it doesn't it, inside the water it doesn't become water anymore it, we call it tea you see the, <laughs> yes. the name changes to something so at that time we don't only say water great example really a great example yeah uh-huh so that's how it works so people need to know how a, a ruhu can evolve to become a nafs, but it doesn't necessarily mean the nafs is a ruhu. We don't say it like that. Yes, I understand better now. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Thank sister. You yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much for your time. So we take the next caller. Thank you for participating. Okay. I appreciate that. Alex. Jis, barin kira kabak nanta call. Can I a question? Barin kira kabak. Yeah, Yo, Alex. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, my name is Tofik Ibrahim. Yeah, Tofik. Yeah, that's Tofik yeah. Ibrahim calling Finland. Yes. Yeah, my question here is: uh, Is it allowed in Islam to take a loan, any kind of bank loan, be it mortgage, flexible loan, credit card, or anything? Of that sort, is it allowed Islam? That's a good question. Now you have you have chance for two questions. You can ask the second okay. question also. No. For now, I only have this question. Okay. So first of all, let's check uh, the information about riba. When we say riba, this is what scholars usually play with. They take this information and they, they play with, and because they don't base their answers from the Quran alone, it becomes a problem. First of all, there is no law or rule in the Quran which says a person cannot take a loan or a credit or a mortgage or anything from the bank. It never says that in the Quran. That is number one. Yeah. Now, but what God is telling us is, according to Quran chapter 30, verse 39, it says, whatever you give of riba to increase in the wealth of the people, in the money of the people, yeah. then it will not increase at God. So let's say I have went to the bank to take a loan and then the bank is asking me for interest, 
right? Mm -hmm. I'm not guilty in the first place for going to take the loan. Nowhere did God says, I'm guilty. Me, the one taking the loan. I'm not guilty. But then the interest I will give the bank, according to God, I don't have any blessings. Okay. No blessing on that. It's not charity, right? Mm -hmm. Then yeah. God says, but what you give of charity, desiring the countenance of God, what you love, then those are the ones which will be multiplied. So if I go out there to give charity from my own money to the poor and the needy and the wayfarer and what, I will get a blessing. But the bank who is taking the money from me, I don't have the punishment because I'm the one in need. I'm desperate for help. So God is rather advising the banks to stop taking the usual. Oh, okay. So what God says, God, what, what God is advising, if you are a believer, you don't need to set up a bank where you are taking interest from people. No. You have to allow people to borrow money and do business. But if they are making business, you can strike a transaction deal with them. According to Quran chapter 2, verse 282, you can make an agreement deal. If it's a business plan where you want to get interest, fine, that is different from uh, riba. Okay. But as far as the Quran is uh, concerned, there's no one single verse which says, if I go to the bank to take a loan, I'm guilty. It doesn't say that. Okay. Mm. So, uh, to cut things short, is that uh, it's the bank that, that I had for. Exactly. For the, the interest. Exactly. But you, as the one in need of it, you have no, you have not, uh, you cannot be blamed. You cannot be blamed because you are, you are forced because you don't have an option or choice. That's why you went for the money. So to top it all, to top it all, Quran chapter two, verse 278, it says, oh, you who believe, beware of God and leave, leave what remains of riba. Okay. You see, so if you are a believer and you have a bank and people come mm -hmm. to your bank to take money, don't take yeah. the interest from them. You leave it for them. Don't take it. Okay. If you are the bank, but the one who is in need going for the loan, he has no blame. Nowhere does he have a blame. Okay. Thank you. Very you are welcome, bro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Salam. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Salam. Your name and where you are calling from. Uh huh. I think your voice is very down, brother. Can you? Uh, increase the volume a bit. Mm -hmm. I can hear you sound and clear now. Yes, I'm like I'm, I'm Shiraz. I'm calling from England. Yeah, well, like um, salam, brother. Brother. Yes. Well, like salam. Like salam. brother. Um, yeah, my I have this notion of um, you know, um, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that none can change His words. So my understanding of this all is like this Quran, this Kitab gives us a guidance uh, for mankind, for Dali Nas. So mankind existed from day one, like before this planet, like the first basic human beings from Adam. Mm -hmm. So up until now, what I'm thinking is every prophet got this book, the Quran. Everyone is this one book we've got. One prophet got this book. Because in the other verse, like, no one can change uh, Allah's words. So no human has more, is more powerful, otherwise God wouldn't be all powerful. So when God told us that, I to say that because in these years, in the future, like, okay, we know the future, like these Sunni sects will come to people, and even the Christians say that the Bible is the truth, but, you know, it's books have been changed here and there. No human can have more power to change Allah's word. So on the day of judgment, everyone, like, isn't be standing on their own dot in court, and it's going to be the biggest sort of, sort of trial of their, you know, entire existence. And then some people can then argue because you're going to get either hellfire or heaven. And then some people argue like, oh, Allah, you gave this generation, say 2022, we're in right now, you gave them this Quran, but our book was this book is different. So you're not the judge and why? Because I was a judge and I had children in my classroom and I had to judge between all of them or come to a um, particular uh, subject to study. And I gave them all the book on that. And I gave one person a book written by another author, but it was still on the same subject. And he could say, if he failed, he could say to me on the day of judgment, like, oh, you know, teacher, you got everyone this book by this certain author, but I was given the same subject on the book of, you know, a book on the same subject, but it was by another author, and that's why I failed. You know, then obviously there's a sort of, you know, it's not balanced there fairly, whereas being Allah subhanahu is all just or merciful. So we've just brought up by, you know, these um, Christians, or, you know, it's basically all the uh, shaitan's work to, you know, confuse mankind to say there's books existed because 
what would Allah put in those ayats in Quran? None can change the words of Allah, and Allah's words can never be you know, exhausted. If you were to bring another sea, we can replenish the sea. It's still warning. So, uh, what do you understand of, from what I'm saying? Do you think? Do you agree? I mean, do you agree with your knowledge? You have. Yeah. To some, to some extent, uh, I agree with you. It makes sense what you said to some extent. Uh, but uh, I don't agree with you when you said the Quran is the same Quran from day one. Uh, uh, are, are, you, are you here with me, brother? Okay, so I guess he'll be on the listening end. Anyways, let me, let me answer his uh, uh, this thing. So... When he said the Quran is, has been there from day one, that is the point I wouldn't uh, buy into that. But when we take Quran chapter 2, verse 213, it says, Mankind was a single nation, then God, what, raised the prophets as, what, missionaries and warners, and revealed the book with them in truth. So he revealed the book with them in truth. Then he says, so that they may judge between the people concerning what they deferred, right? So the book, when we say Al-Kitab, Al-Kitab was given to the prophets, all the prophets, so that they can judge between the people concerning what people have deferred, the difference that people have. Uh, but as to saying that the Quran was there, no. Prophet Abraham didn't re receive a book called Quran. So it was Muhammad, alayhi salam, who received a book called Quran. According to Quran chapter 5, verse 48, According to God, the book he has given to Muhammad is to serve as a muhaiminan over the previous book he has sent in the past. <clears throat> and again, in the same chapter 5, verse 48, to each group, God has given us the law and the methodology, manhaj or minhaja. And he has given us a shari'at, so a law and a what? And a methodology. So every group has its own laws and methodology God has given. So, but the notion of God sending down the book means every prophet was given the book, not the Quran, the book. So when you, when I take you to Quran chapter 6, verse 155 to 157, I'm going to read these three verses and I join them together. Then we get to understand the notion of the Al-Kitab God is telling us about. That will shed light on this topic. So Quran chapter 6, verse 155, God says, and this is a blessed book, which we have revealed. So follow it and become pious so that you may attain mercy. Then 156, lest you say the book was only revealed to two factions before us. And indeed, we were unaware of their studies. 157, or you say, if only the book was revealed to us, we would have been better guided than them. Therefore, a proof or a, an evidence has come to you from your Lord and as guidance and mercy. So who is more unjust than one who denies the verses of God and turns away from them? We will requite those who turn away from our verses with an evil punishment for what they have been shunning or turning away from. You understand? So when you take these verses I just presented, the book has always been the same concept. But what is written in the book differs. So that is why Isa, alayhi salam, he was taught the book, he was taught the wisdom, he was taught the Torah, he was taught the Injil. And we find it in Quran chapter 3, verse 48. Right? Then the prophets as well. When you go to Quran chapter 6, verse 82, you read up to verse 90. They were all given the book and the, uh, the judgment and the prophethood. So when we say the book, the book comes from the word kataba, something you write down. So the words of God given to them, they write it in the book that they have to use it to judge the people. But as to what is written in the book, there will be differences. There will be some something would differ, just like we saw the laws given to the children of Israel. Some of the laws differed concerning what happened at that time and then what was given to the prophet Muhammad as well, which confirms what was before it. So when you go to Quran chapter 7, verse 157, 258, it confirms the notion of some laws which, which were later on altered based on the people and the particular generation the message was sent to. So that should answer the question uh, the brother called to ask, inshallah. Uh, so let me see if I can pick up uh, another caller. Uh, Yeah. 
Eh? Na zoa. Salim, bwe wanga ki kwanchi wa jiraka. Ka ikibiara ya kai tusa. Uche uche kule ko fan na me tusa. Uh, let me, I think I can pick uh, another caller before I end. Let me see. Uh, uh, Salim, can you go for, yeah, Barishi, kere Barishi, na kule, Barishi. Na gode. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, before I go, let me see. Rich Miller is asking a question. He says the Quran, for example, Allah said you should make prayer, but did not mention how. Uh, Rich Miller, your question is just like saying, if I ask you go and shower, go to go and bath. Uh, if you are an intelligent person, must I tell you how to go and bath? You need to know how to go and do that. When you throw out the Quran, you will never see a question where God says, yes, aluna ke anis salat. When they ask you about the salat, tell them to do this or that or that. No, it doesn't exist in the Quran. So it is not a matter of God has said you should do, uh, you use the word prayer, but no, no, no. Uh, Shazma, no problem. I, I've answered your question. If you get the time later, you can watch. I think it's happened around uh, 140 minutes so you can, I have answered your question you ask. Aha, uh -huh. Davis Mas, Salam. Uh, uh, Rashid Bansi says, for me, all books were the same from Allah to all the messengers or the prophets. Yeah, when we say books, we, we will not say books are inside. We say the book. I've already answered the question. Quran chapter 2, verse 213, right? Aha, uh -huh. Salam, Masba, Wali, Salam, welcome. Uh, Sally says, the guy is taking too long. <laughs> Uh, let me see. Uh, guys, I, I think I can pick one more caller before I end. Uh, salam, uh, Don G. Halim. Welcome, brother. Uh, I can pick one more caller. The phone number is down there. I can pick one more caller before I end the program now. So if you have any question, you can ask before I go. And let me see if I've skipped any question which was asked uh, earlier. Uh, Robert Jones, yeah, Salam, you came late. No problem. You can rewatch the program later. So for, for questions I've seen and for any other thing somebody wants to ask, kindly do that before I go. I have a few minutes to drop uh, this topic. Uh -huh. We have the last of this program, yes. Salam alaikum, brother. Your name and where you're calling from? My name is Saka Muhammad. I'm calling from Ghana. Okay, nice to meet you, brother. You're welcome. Okay, so you have two questions. Thank you to... very much. Yeah, please, like, I, I wanted you to explain a particular ayah here for me. So yeah. I, I'll take you to Quran chapter 62, verse 2. Yeah. So uh, the word there. Mm -hmm. So when you read the verse, we have a word like, who are you, Zaki, him? So that word, like purification, right? To purify. Uh, literally, literally, you can say to purify, yeah. Uh -huh. So, like, how does the prophet purify? Uh, in in the sense of, uh, if I'm translating the word, I will not really limit it to purification. It just depends on how you you understand the purification. Uh, for instance. Chapter 62, verse 2, as you, you ask, Who are those who are the ones 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 The word zakah, zakah literally can be to purify, but it also means to vindicate somebody. So let's say somebody has done a wrong thing, and we are going to get the answer in uh, Quran chapter 9, verse uh, 103, right? In Quran chapter 9, verse 103, God says, Khuz min amwalihim sadakatan. Then he says, Tutahiruhum wa tuzakihim biha. 
So he used the word uh, to toy here. This to toy here is to purify. This literally means to purify. Okay. That is toy here, okay. to, to purify something. Then now, apart from the literal yes. purification, he used the word, what to zakih him biha. So he used the word to zakih him and he used the word to toy here. So here, in this sense, to zakih him is actually an act of purification by is a vindication. Let's say somebody has done something wrong. Then you come to amend his mistakes, to, to, to show him how to correct his mistakes. That becomes a vindication. I give an example. Now, when you check the context of chapter 62, verse 2, when God says, ummiyin rasulan minuhum alayhim, uh, then he says, Rasulan minuhum yatlu alayhim ayatihi. Then he says, Wayu zakihim, Wayu alimuhum li kitaba wa likema. Then now he says, Wa in kenu min kabulu, lafi dalalin mubin. So before they were in error. So now, the act of the purification is to vindicate them, to actually let them fix their mistakes so that they will not repeat the mistakes. So that vindicates you. And this is how it works. At the workplace, let's say my boss told me to take something and put on the table, right? Then I made a mistake and I put it on the chair. He said I should put it on the table. So I made a mistake and I put it on the chair. So when my boss came back, now I've done a mistake. So now, in order for my boss to give me the chance to vindicate myself, he will ask me, hey, correctional officer, I ask you, where did I ask you to put the thing? So then I'll be like, oh, sorry, boss. I put it on the chair. So now I'll take it from the chair and I put it on the table. Now, that, that thing that I, my boss gave me the chance to do is the act of vindication. So we can translate it as uh, user key to, to Tazaka. He has given me the chance to purify myself meaning from the mistake I've done. So now I've rectified the mistake. So when God used that word for the messenger, saying, Yetulu alayhim ayati, the verses of God are supposed to help you to correct your mistakes. So Quran chapter 7, verse 35, God says, O children of Adam, if messengers come among you, from you, among you, reciting my verses to you or narrating my verses to you, whoever will reform, Whoever will have the piousness and reform, they will have no fear or, you know, grief. So the act of vindication is to reform yourself from the mistakes you have done pastly. Then now you become a pure person. So that is the user team there. So now the hikma, the hikma, uh, the hikma, that's wisdom, right? Well, literally you translate it as wisdom, but in the Quran is broader than that. It's better, okay. So did, did God give that hikmah to the prophet? It's in the Quran, chapter 17, verse 22, up to verse 39. You can write it down. Quran, chapter 17, verse 22, up to verse 39. Uh -huh. When you read, you see the notion of the al-hikmah. So God told him, Zalika mimma awha ilayka rabbuka min al-hikmah. So those things God mentioned in the list I gave you, chapter 17, verse 22, when you start reading from 22 coming yeah. down, that is what we classify as al-hikmah. You understand? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. So then when you, go, when you now go to Quran, chapter 33, verse 34, God was telling the wives of the prophet that was kurna ma yutla fi buyuti kunna min ayati lahi wal hikmat. He is telling the wives of the prophet to remember what is being recited in their homes of the verses of God and the word al-hikmah. So the al-hikmah are also to be recited to people, and we can find it in the Quran. So that means the hikmah is in the Quran. It is in the Quran, yes. That's why I gave you the verses, chapter 17, verse 34, uh, verse 22 to verse 39. It's in the Quran. It's not outside the Quran. All right. Yes. Okay, then thank you very much. You're welcome, brother. I appreciate that. Thank you for salam. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. so, so uh ladies and gentlemen, now we have done our 40 minutes and okay, let me see.
Uh -huh. uh, Marwan, Devaji, did you say something? Because I don't see your comment. Uh, Ak Isaac Amen says, Correctional officer, please help me out with this question. Mariam and Miriam, which of them is the mother of Jesus according to Quran? It says, my second question is, Adam and Eve are our first parents, and Cain and Abel were the only children after Cain killed Abel. Where did Cain got his wife from? Now, your first question, you ask about Maryam and Miriam. First, Quran only talk about one Maryam. It doesn't talk about, uh, it doesn't mention two different Maryams. It mentions only one Maryam. And then, I know the misconception of chapter 19, verse 26, when people said, well, uh, the family of Maryam says, oh, sister of Harun. Now, what we have to understand is, the Maryam, the Maryam, according to the, the, the Bible, which says that the sister of Moses and Aaron is called Maryam. That is a different sister. We can find her in Quran chapter 27 and 28 concerning Moses when he was born. His sister was the one who pointed that this is the house that can take care of him, right? So that is the different sister. But Quran never mentioned her name as Maryam. No, Quran doesn't mention her name. But however, the misconception people have is to think that when Maryam of the Quran, the mother of Jesus was actually asked, oh, sister of Haruna, they automatically think since Haruna was mentioned, that means the Aaron, the brother of Moses. No, <laughs> there's no connection whatsoever. So this is how misconceptions start. So in the Quran, only Maryam was mentioned. That is the mother of Jesus. No other Maryam has been mentioned by name. Your second question is, Adam and Eve are our first parents, right? Then you said, and Cain and Abel were the only children after Cain killed Abel. Well, the Quran never said the, uh, the two sons of Adam were, were the only children of Adam. It, never, it doesn't say that. I don't know where people got that notion, but that Cain and Abel were the only children of Adam. Quran never says that. He only says the two sons of Adam, right? Sometimes I go to some places. I have, I have two kids. I have a boy and a girl. When I go to some places, I'll be having a discussion and I'll say, oh, my daughter wants me to do, to do this for her. My daughter wants me to do that for her. Then, then later on, this person will see me with two kids. And then we'll be like, ah, you have two kids? And I'm like, yeah. Oh, you didn't tell me you have. And I say, I never said I have only one kid. You, you understand? People like to... It's a misconception. People like to take things out of context and then they assume they know what you're talking about already. So they put their own ideology there. God never said in the Quran, Adam and Eve had only two children. <laughs> it doesn't say that. I don't know where people got that notion from. It doesn't say only two kids. It only gave you a story of out of the of Adam, two sons, what they did. So people then limited to think, oh, Adam, Adam and, uh, and his wife only had two kids. No. Quran chapter 4 verse 1 gives you the clue as to two nafs that God created from each other. And then they multiply, they started multiplying, getting men and women from them. So it doesn't necessarily limit it to having only two children. I hope you understand that answer, uh, Isaac Amen. Right? You can check it for yourself. Quran chapter 4 verse 1. It answers the answer there. Right. Mm -hmm. So, ladies and gentlemen, if there's no more question, because now we have done yeah two hours, I think I've I'm, I'm getting exhausted already, and my water is finished. I need to go and get some water. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, what I'll be doing from next time, next week, God willing, is I'll open up uh, the, the the platform whereby people can actually hop on, uh, bring them, you see the video, their video, and they speak. Uh, he says, sorry, I mean, where did his children got their wives? Well, as for that, that version of statement, if you have read the history of, uh, when we say hominide or homo sapiens, or you reread the, the, the history of how human beings evolve, not from animal, I'm not talking from the animal the type that scientists tell you we have different forms of humans and if you take quran chapter 15 verse 26 
27, 28, 29, it tells you that God created insan, and he created al-bashar, and he created the jinn, jan. So there's a difference between the formalities of bashar and insan, right? So in English, we can say, if, if uh, I don't know, do I have the file somewhere? Let me see if I can uh, find it. Uh, then I can address that point. It talks about the difference between Bashar and Insan. Uh, yes, how many die? How many die is Bashar? That is more than man and extinct immediate ancestors of man. That is uh, how many die. Then we have what we call Homo sapien. Homo sapien is the only surviving hominid, uh, uh, hominid species to which modern man belongs. That is a bipedal primate, having language and ability to make and use complex tools, brain volume at least 1,400 cc. This is insan. So Quran, actually, chapter 15, verse 26, 27, 28, 29, talks about God creating Bashar and then creating insan. So it could be, huh? so this is something I have to do a lecture on. Based on the evidence I've accumulated, I've seen the notion of how God uses the Bashar and the insan. There's difference in human beings. Yes. So I'll be, I'll be addressing about that. But you can read about that, homo sapiens and then hominidae. You read about it, you see there is the difference in human beings. So I think according to the Quran, chapter 15, verse 26, 27, 28, it tells us how God created the gene, how God created the human, uh, the homo sapien, and how God created the hominid die. So among people, there are different types of uh, creations of human beings that God has created. So I think from that, then we, we mix up with, with each other. That's how we got to this position. So it's not necessarily about who they married or who they were with, right? Uh, what God hasn't said, I'll put my words there. But ladies and gentlemen, this is where I leave the topic for now. And God willing, we continue next week. So we honor Rabbi Izzata Amma Yisifun. Wassalamu ala al Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where I leave you for now. Please any be person, your any scholar, sister, till we meet again. Anything. Ask for proof. Thank you. Allah for says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 111, Qul hatu bunanakum, produce your proof in kuntum sadiqin, but if you're truthful. Any scholar, therefore what I say, that what Dr. Zakir Naik says in Islam is zero. No value. What Allah says, carry weight.